issues to go through on this, this uh, agenda. Uh, and the agenda has been circulated. Uh, are there any additions, deletions, or modifications to the agenda as, as uh, circulated? No hands up? Uh, then we'll take the items in the order in which they appear. Approval of the, the uh, proceedings of January 17th. Uh, any comments on the proceedings? Uh, any modifications of the proceedings? Uh, any objection to adopting the proceedings by consensus? Proceedings stand approved. Uh, public comments. Uh, we had one individual uh, sign up, uh, John Goodwin. Uh, John, do you want to come to the microphone, please? And it, the comments here, while well, John's getting himself situated, let me just say that, that we have about 20 representatives from various associations up and down the coast uh, here, lobster associations, uh, LCMTs, and so forth. Uh, and uh, traditionally, our, our practice, uh, since we've already gone through the public comment uh, period, is to uh, uh, kind of curtail the public comments. And I, I, I intend to handle uh, the uh, input from the, the individuals in a slightly different manner today. I'm going to take the public comment from Mr. Goodwin. But then as different issues come up, uh, that involve different LCMTs, for instance. If we've got the president of the local LCMT or, or the president of a, a local uh, association that, that uh, is involved in the decision, then I may single them out uh, and ask them to comment, provided we have the time. Is there any objection to me doing that? No objection, then. Uh, so I'll handle it that way. Uh, Mr. Goodwin, you have the floor for a few minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is John Godwin. I own Point Lobster Company in New Jersey. Uh, we, <clears throat> we import 80% of our lobsters from out of state, mostly Maine and Massachusetts lobsters. Uh, I feel ASMFC should consider adopting lang language that allows for southern New England dealers to buy and sell all legal sizes from LCMA 1. Uh, the result would be an increase in demand for lobsters. Um, currently, the, uh, the, the limits on, on sizes are uh, um, excluding a percentage of the Area 1 catch. Uh, New York and New Jersey are Area 1's closest neighbors. Um, <clears throat> If the overall demand for lobsters is increased by allowing by allowing more of them to come in, uh, you know, as as the demand goes up, it, we're going to be able to sustain the prices paid in Southern New England. By limiting what's coming in, we're just simply losing customers. Um, Canada has already taken steps to promote their fishery. They've uh, eliminated a tariff. Uh, I feel like it's time that uh, Atlantic States considers. Um, amending the, the general possession limits for sale amongst the other states. I realize the importance of having a management tool for the harvest of lobsters, but it's become burdensome on the, on the rest of the industry. You, uh, if we just use Price Chopper, for example, in New York, they, uh, they had a thousand lobsters seized legally caught in Massachusetts. Now, that's not the kind of market where the, you know, uh, the Massachusetts dealer was competing with the lobstermen. The lobstermen in New York had no chance at, at making a sale to Price Chopper. Uh, it's sometimes uh, there's a misunderstanding that uh, lobsters coming in from out of state are going to hurt the local fishery. Uh, I don't think that's true. What we, what we need to do is you know, increase the demand, sustain, sustain the boat price, and just uh, you know, keep keep the ball rolling here to do what we can to help the dealers and help the fishermen. That's really that's all I've got. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, John. And just to follow up on that, John submitted a letter, and I I received uh, a number of other letters from from different members of the public uh, that are here. And my what I'm going to do with those? I'm going to have to circulate circulate those to the to the staff, if there's anyone in the audience that has a letter that they want circulated to the board, 
uh, then please provide it to the young lady sitting on my right, Megan, uh, and we'll copy it and, and pass out copies to the board so they have the benefits, benefits of the uh, public comments. Okay, so we're going to move on with the agenda discussion of deep sea coral amendment, uh, and this is a, a, uh, a general overview. Uh, Michelle? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this some slides coming up. My name is Michelle Bachman. I'm a staff member with the New England Fishery Management Council. I think I know a number of you, but some of you are new faces, so it's nice to meet you and, and happy to talk today about our, our ongoing deep sea coral amendment. Um, basically, what I want to cover, just to make sure you're aware of what the alternatives are that the council is considering, let you know um, which ones they have determined thus far are their preferred alternatives. Um, and then kind of make sure that you're aware of sort of the, the basics of kind of how we're considering impacts in the amendment. I'm happy to take more questions on that if you have them. And then also sort of what the, the timeline is for the next few weeks and months going forward. So next slide. Thanks. Um, so this is basically the problem statement for the amendment. Um, the council adopted this uh, a while back. I think some of you may have seen this already and certainly for those on the council. Um, the core of the problem statement to me is sort of articulating this um, trade-off in the amendment between the conservation of deep sea corals, um, which are vulnerable to the effects of fishing gear, and then balancing any negative impacts on um, fishing fleets and the communities that are supported by those fisheries. So you can take a look sort of at, at what else is in the problem statement, but really I think that's kind of the core of what the council is trying to do is figure out you know, where that balance should be um, and looking at a range of alternatives um, that you know, have different levels of impacts um, in terms of corals or, or impacts to fishing um, activities and trying to figure out you know, kind of where to go with that. Uh, next slide. Um, so just briefly, you know, what are deep sea corals? Um, there's a number of types of different corals in New England. Um, we're learning more all the time about these animals and we've learned a lot in the last, um, say, five years about their distribution and their um, diversity. Uh, but really, uh, what we're focusing on and when we design the alternatives in the amendment, you know, sort of specific spatial management measures focused on different um, aggregations of corals. We're really focused on species that are associated with hard bottom, um, which is a fairly rare habitat type in the Gulf of Maine and also in the deep ocean. Um, so there are sort of soft bottom associated corals, but really in terms of a conservation focus, we were, we're looking at, at corals in hard, hard bottom areas. Uh, next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, there is a diversity of corals in New England. Um, we have learned a lot recently. Um, this is just some imagery of, of some of the different types of corals. Um, some of the black corals um, and even some of the stony corals in the canyons are in quite deep water. Um, others you, you do find in shallower areas. Um, in general, in the shallower parts of the canyons, you've got more soft corals. And in the Gulf of Maine, the fauna we're interested in and focusing our conservation efforts on are, are generally soft corals. And I'll show you some pictures of the, the more common types on the next slide. But um, if you're sort of interested in, in what the science looks like, a good sort of one-stop read would be a, a paper by Quattrini et al. And that's a PLOS One paper from 2015. Uh, it kind of goes through some of the recent data collection with uh, remotely operated vehicles that was done in 2013, I believe. Gives you kind of a good flavor for the types of exploratory surveys that have happened in recent years. Um, next slide. Um, so this just gives you a sense of sort of what some of the really common Gulf of Maine coral species are going to look like out of the water if they were to come aboard a fishing vessel. Um, so the, the two <clears throat> species on the upper right, Paragorgia and Primnoa, are the really common species of soft corals that we see in all the management areas um, that the council is considering in the Gulf of Maine. <clears throat> um, and then there's you know, a number of other different species that occur in deeper areas in the canyons and also on the seamounts. But um, these are sort of um, cosmopolitan species um, you know, found in many different locations around the world. But these are the kind of the main ones that you'd see in, in the Gulf of Maine areas, which are generally between 150 and maybe 250 meters of depth. On the next slide. Um, so you know, big picture, why is the council doing this? And I, I think there's kind of two reasons, really. Um, the first is sort of you know, the idea of conserving corals kind of for their own um, sake, you know, just for their existence value. Um, these are you know, very uh, long-lived animals. Um, they you know, have slow growth rates. 
um, kind of limited reproduction potential, um, and then just you know kind of wanting to conserve you know their biodiversity, um, but also their important habitat. Um, as you know, being structure forming organisms, they provide habitat for fishes. Um, those that are managed by the commission and the council and, and others that are not, um, they have close associations with other invertebrate species. Um, and so corals are definitely an important, um, play an important ecological role. Next slide. Um, so this is something that, that, that the board may want to discuss and maybe you have in the past, um, but sort of the management authority that the council is developing these measures under. Um, the last time the, the Magnuson-Stevens Act was reauthorized, there were actually provisions added um, to allow councils to take sort of discretionary action to protect deep sea corals in particular. Um, and so that's really kind of been the focus of, the, that authority has been the focus of the council's discussions. Um, what it allows us to do is sort of decouple coral conservation from essential fish habitat. Um, in many cases, the corals occur in quite deep water, um, out to thousands of meters, including on the seamounts, um, and that's really beyond the habitat of species that are managed by the council. Um, and so it, it's kind of less of a stretch to use this broader discretionary authority than to have to link coral conservation with our essential fish habitat designations and, and that sort of program that the council um, implements. Um, there is some guidance that we got, um, I guess two pieces of guidance that we got from first from the Greater Atlantic Regional Fisheries Office back um, when they were NERO. Um, in 2010, we got a, a guidance letter from them about how to think about the discretionary provisions. Subsequent to that, in 2014, um, NIMS kind of at a national level published some guidance, you know, basically explaining kind of the obligations of the council when using the discretionary authority, um, the things we need to consider, the consultation that we need to do, for example, with the commission if considering regulation of um, gears managed by other management authorities such as the commission or the Mid-Atlantic Council. Um, so we've been doing a lot of consultation. We have membership on our committee, um, et cetera. But if you're interested in the specifics of that letter, it is on our website. If you go under the Habitat page and look for the Coral Amendment, you can see that, that guidance document. Um, so the next slide. Um, so just big picture, um, other regions of the country are also working on deep sea coral management and, and do have some areas in place that sort of serve this role or areas are under development. Um, but it's just in terms of the Atlantic coast um, from basically uh, North Carolina northward, um, the, both the Mid-Atlantic and the New England Fishery Management Council have been working on this for a while. Um, the Mid-Atlantic measures did go into effect at the beginning of this year in January. Um, and essentially what they developed was kind of this broad coral zone that encompasses the whole uh, slope region kind of within the Mid-Atlantic's kind of jurisdictional footprint out to the EEZ boundary. Um, and their zone starts at around 450 meters. It does go shallower in the heads of some of the canyons. Um, we've heard a lot of discussion about sort of how their process is similar to the New England process or how it's different. Um, the lobster fishery being actively involved in our process and being a fishery that the council is actively considering managing in these coral areas is the biggest difference between, I think, the New England process and the process the Mid-Atlantic went through. Um, so I think that's kind of influenced, you know, our discussions throughout and sort of some of our public outreach and the focus of our analysis and how we've spent our time. Um, but I'm happy to talk more about the Mid-Atlantic Amendment if, if people have any questions. Um, so next slide. Um, so these are sort of the core alternatives in the amendment in a nutshell. Um, essentially we've got, we're looking at a range of spatial management areas that could be designated for coral protection. Um, there's these broad, large broad zones which you saw on the previous slide and I'll show you again on the next slide um, with sort of depth limits as the shallow boundary. Um, and we're considering a different, uh, six different options there. Um, and then we have these discrete zones. We have these canyon zones and seamount zones that are sort of nested within that broad area. And then in the Gulf of Maine, we have some other areas that we're considering, a couple inshore, um, Mount Desert Rock and Outer Scudic Bridge, and then a couple further offshore within Area 3, Linnacol Knoll, and, and some areas within George's Basin. Um, and then in terms of the gear restrictions that could apply within those zones, um, we're looking at either a prohibition on all bottom tending gears, whether they be a fixed gear like a trap or a long line or a gill net, or a mobile gear like a trawl. Um, dredges would also be considered a mobile gear, but they're not really used in these steps. 
um, from the data that we've looked at and the comments we've heard, um, or the council may consider just prohibitions on mobile bottom tenant gears only. Um, and under the fixed and mobile bottom tenant gear restriction, the council is considering a couple of different exemptions. Um, one would be to exempt the red crab um, trap fishery. Um, that's managed by our council. Um, it's a relatively small fishery. I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, and then the other option would exempt other trap fisheries. And so that would include folks fishing with lobster traps. Um, it would also include, for example, in Jordan Basin, there's a hagfish pot fishery that would kind of fall under that as well. Um, and then there is some transiting language that what's up on the slide, um, it was adopted um, by the Mid-Atlantic Council and is, is in the regulations for their coral zone. And it's a little relaxed relative to some of the language around transiting that's, that's currently in the federal um, regulations. Uh, next slide. So I've struggled with a way to represent this visually that isn't any way clear, so I apologize. But um, basically what you've got here um, on the left-hand panel is sort of the general location of these broad zones. Um, they're quite large areas that, you know, have these different depth-based limits. And then on the right-hand side, you can see um, the kind of green shading is basically everything that's deeper than 600 meters. Um, and that's what the, the council's preferred alternative is kind of define a zone, um, you know, the entire slope uh, region out to the EEZ that encompasses the seamounts, you know, within sort of the New England Council's footprint. Um, draw some simplified boundary lines to define that zone um, so that, you know, there are specific coordinates that people could put in a plotter and understand and know if you were within the zone or outside it. Um, but the criteria for that was that the zone be um, no shallower than 600 meters. So that, that green is sort of what that footprint looks like. Um, and then what we developed, what I developed, is basically a simplified line that um, it kind of doesn't, you know, go any shallower than that green footprint. Um, and then we've got a number of other um, options that we're considering as well. Um, there's one that has sort of an average depth of 600 meters but goes as shallow as 550. Um, there's another one that has an average depth of five, can go no shallower than 450, um, one that targets 400 meters, and one that targets 300 meters. Um, and then there's also an option, I think, that really bounds the analysis nicely that targets 900 meters, so it's much deeper, um, which is kind of solidly outside the footprint of any fishing, including the red crab fishery. Um, so next slide. Um, and then we have these series of discrete zones. And so the, this first slide just talks about the different canyon zones and the seamount zones. Um, this is just a list of the different canyons that um, we're considering. There are some other smaller canyon features, um, but these are all the ones that um, have had coral sampling. So we know, you know for certain um, from a couple to six or seven um, either remotely operated vehicle or towed camera dives that there are corals, sort of what the species composition is and that sort of thing, what the zonation is a bit by depth. Um, so these are the areas where we have kind of detailed information and they're all the larger canyons in the New England region. Um, and the coloring, the, the yellow ones are those that are outside the um, Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument and the red ones are inside. Um, the council had a sort of lengthy discussion about whether to continue developing management areas within the monument um, and ultimately decided that they wanted to keep these measures as part of the amendment um, to sort of see what the impacts would be um, and kind of continue with their own management program in spite of the monument designation. Um, and so that just kind of breaks those apart um, visually for you. And we did kind of break out some of the analysis um, by canyons in the monument and not to sort of show the additive potential impact of um, other zones that might be designated by the council. And then the th four blue areas are the New England seamounts um, that are within the exclusive economic zone. That seamount chain does go much further to the east, but those are the four that are in the easy, and those are also being considered as discrete management zones. Um, the canyon zones and the seamount zones are, none of these are um, preferred alternatives at this time. Um, so they are in the document and the council is looking to receive comments on them. Um, but right now the, the preference is to just go with a broad zone approach with that 600 meter minimum and not to designate these additional um, discrete zones that go into sort of shallower water. Um, so we had kind of framed it for the council, you know, if they could take a mix and match approach. Um, combining the two areas, maybe going shallower in the canyons, and ultimately they, at this time, they seem to prefer just a single, somewhat deeper um, approach. So next slide. 
So moving into the Gulf of Maine, we've got different, basically four different locations that we're looking at. Um, first would be Mount Desert Rock, um, and so essentially we can see on here there's a couple of different areas, the sort of larger um, red boundary, and then within that there's a smaller blue outline boundary. So the council is considering both of those options um, as boundaries for this management area. Um, right now they don't have a preference for which. Um, the smaller boundary was developed later in the process, so that's kind of a more recent refinement. Um, and you know, assuming that, that this area um, does is designated, the council's recommendation would be a mobile bottom tending gear closure only. So um, importantly, lobster traps could continue to be used in this area. That's really the only gear type that has any significant activity um, within the, the larger of the boundaries. So, and I expect within the smaller boundary as well as it's a subset. Um, next slide. Um, so the next area is Outer Scudic Ridge. Um, this is within um, Lobster Management Area Zone A in, in Area 1, um, beyond 12 miles from shore. Um, we only have the, the one boundary option for this area. Um, this is a preferred alternative at this time as a closure to mobile bottom tending gear. And so again, that wouldn't restrict um, the lobster fishery. Um, next slide. Um, so Jordan Basin, um, there's basically four different sort of locations that we're looking at in Jordan Basin. Um, from the, the sort of general charts that show us the bottom topography in Jordan Basin aren't fantastic. We only have really detailed mapping for certain areas within the basin. Um, but generally in sort of higher relief areas is where you tend to find these coral habitats. Um, and so some of the locations that have been documented are on a couple of these uh, bumps and then sort of more towards the center of the basin along the Hague line. Um, and so we've got a uh, 96 fathom bump, 118 fathom bump, and then the largest area is 114 fathom bump. And then the eastern area is that central Jordan basin area. Um, so within that, the committee and the council in the last couple months have discussed, you know, can we refine these a little bit more tightly around where the corals have been observed, where we think the high relief areas are. Um, and so we really kind of um, focus down on, on smaller subsets of these original um, area boundaries to develop the second option. Um, so right now the council hasn't recommended designating zones in Jordan Basin as preferred. They didn't really say it wasn't preferred either. They, they're sort of still deciding, I think. Um, but if areas are designated in Jordan Basin, they are recommending that they be mobile bottom to acre closures, not closures to fixed gears. Um, so again, that wouldn't affect the lobster fishery. We do know that there's um, Groundfish and monkfish and some other um, species that would be caught with either um, gill nets or trawls are also um, caught in these areas. Um, and then there's also a hagfish fishery in Jordan Basin as well, as I mentioned. Um, and then the next slide, I'll just show you quickly, is just an image of some of the types of features and corals that you would see in, in Jordan Basin, um, different soft corals and then other um, fishes and invertebrates associated with them. Um, so next slide. Um, so uh, the final area that we're looking at in the Gulf of Maine is Linden Coal Knoll. Um, this is kind of the uh, sort of western edge of, of Georgia's Basin, which is the deepest part of the Gulf of Maine. Um, we don't really have great um, data on the seafloor terrain in, in Linden Coal Knoll, but we do have some um, RV dives that, on which corals have been observed. Um, and so we have basically two boundary options that we're considering here, this larger area, option one, and then option two would be three sub-areas focused around the dive sites. Um, and similarly with Jordan Basin, the council hasn't yet come down on whether they actually want to designate uh, management areas for corals in linen coal, but if they do, they did want to go with a mobile bottom to ear closure. Um, so next slide. And so this just kind of sums up kind of where the lobster management areas are and how those relate to the coral zones. Um, so the different colored shadings are the, the main management areas. So the um, Scudic Ridge is in Area A, the Mount Desert Rock in Area B, and then all the remaining areas are within um, Area 3. Um, so I think that's all I wanted to say there. Um, so next slide. Um, and then finally, in addition to sort of the meat of the amendment, these coral management areas and the measures for them, um, there's a couple other programs and, and options that Council's considering. Um, we talked early on in the process of developing this amendment about the idea of maybe developing some special access programs. So, you know, they might be more, these areas could be broadly closed, but allowing particular fisheries to continue operation under specific criteria, um, or exploratory fishing, for example, for, you know, 
currently unharvested deep water stocks. Um, the council didn't develop any of those options more fully as kind of specific programs. Um, what they do want to do, you know, at this time is under kind of research activities, just request that folks doing research, scientific research in these zones, ask for a letter of acknowledgement from the fisheries um, service, just to, so we can kind of keep better track of what's happening in terms of research in these areas. Um, but that's, you know, pretty limited um, alternative. Um, and then in terms of framework adjustments, um, I think many of you probably know the council tends to work um, either on amendments, which are kind of larger initiatives, or framework adjustments. The idea with those is they can happen a little bit um, more quickly with fewer meetings. They're supposed to be kind of more limited in scope and have fewer kind of moving parts. Um, so in general, the council is, you know, kind of added to the list of things that we can consider doing within a framework. Um, and so this would basically just all these new types of measures that are part of this amendment, it would add that into that. Um, so we would specify that you could add new coral zones, change them, change their fishing restrictions, um, or develop these exploratory fishing or special access programs through frameworks. Um, the next slide. Um, just to recap, the preferred alternatives, again, um, the main one would be the sort of 600 meter zone, um, close to all different types of fishing with an exemption for red crab. Um, and then it would have this minimum depth of 600 meters. Um, so that's what the council's um, recommending for the, the slope and the canyons and the seamounts. Um, in terms of the Gulf of Maine, the council recommended all those zones be mobile bottom tending gear closures only. Um, they did recommend um, designating coral management areas at Mount Desert Rock and Outer Scudic Ridge um, and still on the fence about those offshore sites. Um, and then the, the other measures as indicated. Um, the next slide. Um, and so just kind of quickly in terms of how we're thinking about impacts analysis, um, basically, you know, we only have sampling for corals at, at select locations within these zones. Um, and so in addition to using the information from those research cruises, we can also use suitability modeling results as well as terrain data, figuring out where there's steeply sloping areas and things like that to get a sense for the total amount of coral habitat we might be protecting with the different alternatives. Um, and then sort of combining that with what we know about different fishing activities that might be prohibited under a different option, we can kind of make an assessment of um, what the conservation benefits would be to corals of any given management zone. Um, next slide. Um, we do know, you know, something about um, fishing gear impacts on corals. Um, we've got some information about growth. Um, you know, some of the major species in the Gulf of Maine that were on that, that earlier slide, you know, really um, only grow a few centimeters a year. So, you know, if they're disturbed or removed, um, it takes them a while to repair um, the damage or to recolonize an area. Um, we, you know, certainly also acknowledge that the areas where the council's considering management are currently fished and these corals continue to persist there. Um, you know, whether that indicates that they have some resilience to impact or if there's, you know, really the corals are in parts that are, you know, more difficult to fish, um, very steep habitats or that sort of thing, you know, we, we don't entirely know. Um, it may be that, you know, some of these corals in the Gulf of Maine or in shallower parts of the canyons are sort of, um, you know, the remains of, of a larger distribution of corals that was there previously, we're just really not sure. Um, next slide. Um, so basically, just to kind of wrap up here, we're kind of taking a look at a couple different sources of data, um, and you guys have talked about this in the past, so don't need to go into a lot of detail. The focus has been trip reports. Um, the commission also sent out a survey last spring about area three and, and people's activity um, by depth and by area in area three, and the results of that were used to kind of assess how much revenue is occurring at different depth intervals. And so we're using all that information from the commission survey and from the um, technical committee's reporting in our unfolding that into our EA. Uh, next slide. Um, and in the inshore Gulf of Maine, you know, we have sort of a, a, a different set of challenges in terms of um, understanding the activity, fishing activity that's occurring within these two zones. It's you know, by and large, um, the lobster fishery is, is what's going on here, and there's very little evidence of other types of fishing um, in the data that we've looked at, at least. 
Um, so we worked with DMR through the TC to get some information about these areas, sort of how many individuals are fishing, um, you know, what months they're, they're fishing, what proportion of their revenue might be coming from these areas, and then coming up with some different estimates of how much revenue may be coming out of these two locations on an annual basis. And so that all the information that we've, we've gotten through the TC and DMR is kind of folded into our documents. Um, next slide. Um, just finally, the, we're also looking at all those um, sort of impacts to fisheries at the level of different fishing communities. Um, and so we've done that based on data from the dealer reports and the trip reports, um, as well as information through DMR about which, which ports are sort of most important to the people fishing in these areas. So that's all discussed in our information. Um, next slide. Um, and just finally to, to wrap up, um, the timeline for the amendment. Um, so right now we're kind of in this public comment period that'll end on June 5th. And in a couple weeks we'll be doing public hearings. Um, and the schedule is on our, it's actually I put it on the next slide. Um, and you can get the notice with the specifics on our website as well. Um, and it should be in the Federal Register this week if not already. Um, on May 30th, the committee is going to meet um, in Wakefield, Massachusetts and, and review the comments from the hearings and discuss if they want to make any revisions to their recommendations about preferred alternatives. And then the council is scheduled to take final action in June. Um, we're figuring out sort of which date of the meeting that might be. Um, and then provided that that schedule is, is met, then we'll probably submit the, the amendment document um, towards the end of the summer, early fall, um, for implementation early next year. Um, so the next slide just has the list of public hearing um, opportunities. Again, you can grab this off our website. And we are, our last hearing, um, kind of leading into the Memorial Day weekend, is a webinar, which you're all welcome to listen in on um, or, you know, participate in, comment. Um, and there's instructions, detailed instructions for registering in the hearing notice. Um, so that's all I've got. Um, the next slide is just a nice picture of a dogfish. Um, I think this is at Outer Scooter Ridge. I'm happy to take questions, and thanks Thanks for your attention. Questions? <clears throat> Any questions? Dan, you, you, know, you look like you're waving your finger. Well, I, I was curious if there's been any thought given to uh, compliance, and how would you know if a vessel in the future, if this was not enacted, had fished in that zone? Yeah, so these areas would be enforced similar to other spatial management areas um, through VMS for vessels that have VMS um, through kind of Coast Guard sort of direct observation in, in cases vessels that don't have VMS. Um, we talked a lot about at we had some workshops and also at the committee about whether you know the intent was really to avoid having gear on the bottom within these zones but really what's enforceable is the vessel being within the zones. Um, and so the chairman can probably speak to this, but the, um, I, I think the idea behind that 600 meter minimum zone was that that was deep enough to kind of accommodate giving space for people that are fishing a little bit shallower than that in reality. So kind of putting this buffer in, but especially given how far offshore some of these sites are, you know, enforcement I think is going to be difficult to be kind of fully enforced. Yeah, I'll, I'll follow up on Dan's question also since I represent the commission on the, on the committee that, that there actually was a lot of discussion about the need to have buffers here. If the concept uh, of this whole program is, is to freeze the existing footprint, then you want to do so in a manner that's enforceable, but you don't want to have absolute lines on the boundary. You want to kind of move the line away from uh, the boundary area that you want to protect, and that's exactly the reason the committee talked about this 600-meter line. Uh, they, they were actually talking about a line that was inside of that, and then when we talked about the uh, concept of buffers and how you would enforce it and how the Coast Guard would, would enforce it, we decided to move the line out to 600 meters. So other, other comments or questions on this? Okay, so uh, since the uh, council is going to meet on June 20th to the 22nd and finalize a position on this, uh, if we want to have input, I think what, what we, we should do is entertain a, a uh, motion uh, on the subject. Somebody 
want to make a motion. I also note that we have a number of New England Council representatives here. I believe all of them, and correct me if I misspeak, voted in favor of the preferred uh, alternatives when it came up, with the possible exception of one. Um, Eric, you want to make a motion? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Somebody has it other than me. Okay. Uh, move to recommend to the policy board supporting the preferred alternatives developed by the New England Fisheries Management Council in their deep sea coral amendment. If I get a second, I have some rationale. There are a second. Seconded by Pat Kelleher. Discussion. Eric. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Michelle. It was a great presentation. I really, my rationale goes with her, her, her comments. Um, New England has taken a, a the Mid-Atlantic went first in their coral action, but they, they did not, uh, under current legal advice at the time, they did not include lobster gear. New England received new advice, as Michelle referenced. So basically, New England is more restrictive than the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, in their action, as it, it will be regulating all bottom tending gear. Uh, and as the chairman referenced, it is actually a freeze the footprint approach, a true freeze approach. Uh, freeze the footprint approach, sorry. Um, and, and that came through many, many committee, Habitat Committee meetings, uh, two public workshops to identify from the industry where they actually fished, um, and council discussion. Um, and that footprint uh, has been decades in the making, decades in the making. It is a discretionary action, um, but um, I think we should support the alternatives as the council and its committee and its workshops has developed. Thank you. Pat, you want to offer comments as a seconder and then I'll go to Doug Grout. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just want to echo uh, Eric's statement, um, in particular, the impact of the state of Maine's lobster fishery, uh, if it was included, um, would have been in the multi-millions of dollars. Uh, would have been an economic uh, impact to uh, many fishermen in Zone A and Zone B. Uh, became very problematic. So we certainly support the council's uh, preferred alternative uh, in this process and uh, uh, certainly uh, would ask everybody to support the motion. Thanks, Pat. Doug? Just a clarification of the motion is the intent is you'd send a letter supporting preferred alternatives? I'm assuming a letter would be better than a smoke signal, Doug. Yeah, that would be fine. <laughs> just for the record, so that we know what we're voting on. <laughs> All right, any other comments? Uh, Pete Burns. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to point out that I'll abstain on the vote because this amendment will likely come before NOAA Fisheries for implementation soon. Thank you. Anyone else at the table? Uh, is there anyone in the audience who wants to make a comment on the motion? No hands up. Okay, so you're ready for the question. All those in favor, uh, please signify. Do you need a caucus? Excuse me. Caucus? Anyone need a caucus? No, nope, no one needs a caucus. So uh, uh, everyone in favor, signify by raising your right hand. Eleven, 11 in favor. Any, any opposed? No opposed. Uh, abstentions. One abstention. Any null votes? Motion carries. Eric, did you, uh, and I should have mentioned this at the start of the meeting, did you also want to talk about the notice from the Department of Interior? Thank which, you. Which I would point out for uh, everyone's edification, the president has asked the uh, Department of Interior to solicit input on the on uh, the monuments, and there's been a notice that's been circulated, and Eric will describe what it is. Uh, and then we'll take up the issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is dated uh, May 5th, which was last Friday. It's from the Department of the Interior, the Office of the Secretary. And it says the Department of Interior today announced the first ever formal public comment period for members of the public to officially weigh in on monument designations under the Antiquities Act. Um, it's not a very long press release. Maybe uh, 
staff could shoot it out to members if you want to look at it. But uh, if you remember not that long ago, the, uh, the commission developed a, a position letter which was presented to the Office of CEQ by Chairman Grout and several of the members. And I, I think since this is a unique opportunity, the first of its kind, that uh, the commission should um, reinforce the, our initial advice to the previous administration and comment on this, uh, on this issue. Um, hopefully you all remember the, the, the letter that we sent uh, to the president uh, describing what we felt was, a, was an optimum solution uh, to the use of the Antiquities Act. And I don't remember the exact vote in front of the policy board, but uh, it was 13 to 0 to 1 or some, it was something to, to 0 to 1. So uh, um, I, I think since it's a unique opportunity, the first of its kind, that we should, we should reinforce our, our initial position uh, through uh, our original position and uh, a, a cover letter or something that, uh, that outlines uh, the conditions of, of today. Thank you. So oh, I guess the uh, question uh, for the board is that the comment period is over before our next meeting. Uh, so uh, what's a preference for the board? Would, would you like to entertain a motion, make a recommendation to the, to the uh, policy board to submit a letter? Uh, what record, uh, Eric is suggesting is basically to re uh, restate our position. Um, so comments on that concept. Anyone? Pat. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would, uh, I would recommend uh, sending a request to the policy board that a letter be sent on this particular issue. Uh, and I think it should be sent both to the uh, Secretary of Interior and the Secretary of Commerce. Uh, Governor LePage recently met uh, with the Secretary of Interior uh, and actually brought this particular issue up. Um, it is not included in the list, list that is being reviewed now, but uh, a letter from this body, I think, would be appropriate. Okay, comments uh, to Pat's suggestion. Eric? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Obviously, I support uh, Commissioner Kelleher's advice, but in, in this press release, it, it, the Atlantic Monument is clear, clearly outlined as one that is under consideration. So uh, if, if uh, you please, Mr. Chairman, I have a motion. I, let me just see if anyone has a, another suggestion. Anyone here uncomfortable with us restating our position? I don't see any hands up. Uh, yes, Sarah. Uh, thank you. And, and I was in support of uh, the first letter that we sent. I had at that time objections to the fact that I felt there wasn't an adequate uh, public uh, comment period that um, the New England Council had already taken some measures regarding fishing moratoriums. What my concern is now is a, an, over, uh, an outright lifting of the monument status could open up uh, this area around the canyons and seamounts to activity that would have a great detrimental effect to the fishing industry, i.e. offshore drilling or other sorts of uh, mining and uh, resource uh, taking activities. So um, my issue isn't so much with the repeal of the monument status, but an outright repeal without some sort of replacement to ensure that the habitat uh, remain um, a healthy one for fishing endeavors and the fishing industry uh, without uh, activity that would degrade that. Uh, that is, that's where my level uh, of discomfort is today as we, as we sit here in May. Thank you. Um, let me ask Doug and uh, Bob Beal whether or not they have a preference for how we handle this. Seems to me that there's uh, just looking at the reading, the tea leaves around the table, that people want to comment, but it, it seems to me that, that we need to perfect the letter that people would be comfortable with. Uh, so I guess my question to the chair and the executive director is, should we pass a motion and then ask the staff to draft a letter and circulate it uh, so that people get a chance to look at the letter and and be a little bit more comfortable with it. Would that make more sense, Bob? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What if, what if we redistributed or distributed the letter that we sent about a year ago? I guess it was back, you know, to the full commission, the policy board. People could have, a, you know, 48 hours to look at it before Thursday, and see if that still is your position. And if you're, if everyone's comfortable with that position still, we can, you know, put a cover letter on that, stating why we're sending it in, um, in response to this comment opportunity. And if that's not the position. We can sort out the position at the policy board uh, in a couple of days, but we can we'll send around that letter, um, you know, our previously submitted letter, and folks can look at it and then come to the policy board ready to, to comment whether it is or is not our position. Yeah. Uh, anyone object to that? Any objections? So let's let's uh, follow that process. We'll circulate the letter. And I mean, I, I just point out from a personal perspective, it's, uh, I, I agree with Sarah's comments completely, um, but I'd also point out that it's a little bit um, concerning that, that we've got a position on the Coral Amendment, which is basically 600, endorsing 600 meters, and the original position that we endorsed was 900 meters uh, in, with a monument, and I think if we're going to circulate the letters, we should think about whether or not we want to standardize those two positions, uh, which I think would be valuable input to the regulatory agencies that are trying to deal with us. So we'll circulate the letters, and then um, we'll see what the reaction to it is, and maybe dis discuss it at the policy board. Okay. Any objections to doing that? Okay. So anything else on corals? Uh, before we move off corals, uh, I would just like to take the opportunity to, to thank Michelle for all her work on this. She's a fabulous staffer. The New England Council should be extraordinarily pleased with her performance. And, uh, you know, she's done a tremendous job working on this issue in the absence of a lot of information. She's, she's really pushed people, and she's pushed the whole envelope. And I think we should be thankful for all of her efforts. So thank you very much. Uh, next uh, uh, item here, we're going to take on the um, George's Bank Gulf of Maine subcommittee, and I'm going to turn it right over to Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'm going to be reviewing the Gulf of Maine George's Bank Lobster Subcommittee report today. Um, just as a reminder, this subcommittee was formed in January in response to the technical committee's report on changing stock conditions in the Gulf of Maine and George's Bank. So just to kind of take a step back and remind ourselves of why this subcommittee was formed and why the TC has been looking into changing stock conditions. Um, looking at this slide here and kind of taking Maine as a case study, we can see that over the past 30 to 40 years, there's been really an incredible increase in the amount of landings that are coming from the Gulf of Maine. Um, and particularly in the last 10 or so years, there's been an exponential increase in those landings. But at the same time, um, we kind of have a unique dichotomy here because we are starting to see declines in the settlement surveys. So these are the main settlement surveys from the various statistical areas. And what you can see is over the past five or so years, we've started to see noticeable, noticeable declines in those settlement surveys. And this is concerning because if this truly does reflect a decline in settlement, then this could foreshadow decreased recruitment and landings in the future. So the subcommittee met on April 13th in Durham, New Hampshire. We had participants from Maine through Rhode Island. This included board members, TC members, industry association leaders, and lobstermen. And there were three purposes of this meeting. The first was to discuss current and future conditions in the Gulf of Maine Georges Bank stock, to discuss ways to promote resiliency in the stock given changing environmental conditions, and then also to provide recommendations to the board as to how to best proceed. So there were three questions that kind of started off the discussion from the subcommittee. 
And the first question is, how are we currently protecting spawning stock biomass? And the subcommittee concluded that we're currently protecting spawning stock biomass through the V-notch program, the minimum gauge size, and the maximum gauge size. Um, and many noted that that minimum gauge size may be protecting an increasing portion of spawning stock biomass, given that we're seeing an earlier size at maturity. The next question was, what does the Gulf of Maine lobster fishery look like with less catch? And I think the concern here is that decreased lobster catch could have rippling economic effects, even if the stock is still biologically healthy. Um, and this is kind of even more concerning given the fact that many lobstermen are not diversified in their catch. And then the third question is, are there any deficiencies in the current management plan? And many pointed to the fact that currently under our reference points, management action is not triggered until abundance falls to the 25th percentile. Um, and given that we're at record high landings now, this means that landings would likely have to fall by over 50% before any management action is triggered. The second part of our subcommittee discussion focused on lessons learned from southern New England. Um, and these lessons learned were provided by some of the Rhode Island and Massachusetts members of the subcommittee. So the first lesson learned was be proactive. Um, many pointed to the fact that de the decline in the southern New England stock um, happened over a relatively short period of time, particularly in Long Island Sound. And so waiting to see a couple years of decreased landings and then initiating that management action may be too late. The second lesson learned was to address excess in the system. So this includes things such as latent traps, unused permits, um, as well as the continued purchase of larger and faster boats. The third lesson learned was to standardize management measures. Um, in southern New England, many of the addenda have allowed the LCMAs to kind of tailor their own management proposal to meet a target. Um, and while this provides flexibility, it also can create enforcement challenges um, and lessen the expected biological benefits of the management rules. And then the fourth lesson learned was 100% harvester reporting. Um, some noted that if management tools are considered which are based on historic participation in the stock, then it's going to be important to have information as to when fishermen were uh, harvesting. So we have preliminary recommendations from the subcommittee. I do want to note these are preliminary because the subcommittee has asked for another meeting to better flesh these out. Um, but I did want to review these in case there's any discussion on them. Uh, the first is to conduct additional research. Um, one of the things that kept popping up, popping up is the need for a coast-wide study on growth and maturity. Um, the TC members noted that the data that's currently being used is over 20 years old, um, and this should really be updated. The second recommendation is to continue to monitor the ventless trap survey and the trawl surveys. So the subcommittee agreed with the TC that if that settlement survey is truly reflecting a decline in settlement, this will next be seen in the ventless trap surveys and the trawl surveys. The third recommendation is to improve enforcement offshore. Um, so many noted that we are seeing an expansion of the lobster fishery offshore, um, and also with an increase in the value in Gulf of Maine, there seems to be um, more issues with compliance. The fourth recommendation was to develop an environmental indicator. So this again was an original recommendation of the TC um, to include some sort of model-free indicator that can look at environmental anomalies such as water temperature. The fifth was to develop an economic indicator and trigger. So this really developed from the fact that some of these concerns are economic and we may see economic effects before the stock is biologically unhealthy. So this indicator could look at landings over a specified period of time and if they decrease by a certain percentage that could uh, trigger management action. And I think this is one of the things that the subcommittee would like to further discuss. And then the sixth recommendation was to modify the current reference points. Um, the subcommittee agreed with the TC that management action should be triggered at the 50th percentile of abundance rather than the 25th. 
So kind of some takeaways and ways to move forward here. Um, I think one of the largest conclusions was that economic effects will likely be felt before biological triggers are met. And therefore, there may be deficiencies in the current management plan, which may need to be addressed in order to build resiliency in the Gulf of Maine Georges Bank stock. And that could include changes to the reference points as well as the development of an, environment, excuse me, an economic indicator. Um, there are some things that the board is already doing that we can continue to do. So through the FMP review, we do monitor the ventless trap surveys as well as the trawl surveys. And the LEC is continuing to have a discussion on offshore enforcement. So those are two of the things that the board is already working on. And with that, I will take any questions. Question, question for Megan. Uh, yes, Richie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, was there any suggestions as to how to improve uh, law enforcement offshore? I believe there's a recommendation for electronic tracking on vessels, um, but besides that, there were no other specific recommendations. Just to follow up on Richie's question, uh, the Enforcement Committee, uh, as I think many of you will recall, about six months ago, or maybe nine months ago, we, we engaged the Lives Board, kind of engaged the Enforcement Committee, and pointed out that there were problems. A uh, number of us, Pat Kelleher and myself, I know Richie uh, attended the Enforcement Committee meeting. And so the, the enforcement, enforcement Committee has been trying to develop different systems to deal with near shore, kind of the mid-shelf zone, and offshore. And uh, some of that relates to technology. Uh, other aspects uh, relate to modifying the joint enforcement agreement uh, and so forth. So that's kind of a work in progress, uh, but it definitely needs to take place um, in this particular case. Uh, and it is, is uh, in progress. So, Richie, you want to follow up on Pat? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, at, at that meeting, there was a discussion that um, uh, from National Marine Fishery Service that lobster was not a priority species in their list of priorities. And uh, there was discussion at that point about how do we move it up. And I don't know if there was any decision on that, um, if there needs to be. Uh, additional encouragement um, from this board to, to have that happen. Megan? So we did send a letter to NOAA OLE um, asking that they move up the pri prioritization of lobster and that was a motion that was passed at a previous policy board meeting um, and we heard that this was the appropriate time to send that so that has been sent. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The um, timing here, I think, is good with this subcommittee uh, elevating law enforcement and with the law enforcement committee meeting tomorrow. Um, I think it would be really good to bring back a break, bring this conversation back to the law enforcement committee to make sure they're prioritizing it. So anything else that may be recommended from the law enforcement committee is on a parallel track with the subcommittee. Um, and we can get some finalization of um, some really strong recommendations. Major Cloutier, the representative here today, is uh, I'd like to think he's well versed now on offshore lobster problems. Uh, so uh, it'd be good if he could bring, um, uh, bring this message back to the Law Enforcement Committee meeting. Renee, I won't put you on the spot, but if you'd like to comment, please do so. If not, we'll move on. No? Okay. That's okay. Don't, no need to do it. Uh, anyone else? Table. Okay, so uh, l let me just add a couple of things to the... Uh, oh, excuse me. Pat. I'm sorry not to belabor this point, but be because 100% harvester reporting is on the table again within this subcommittee, and we all know how much the state of Maine loves this conversation, um, and the fact that we have, um, you know, about a half a million dollar impact uh, to the cost associated with this. With the reporting subcommittee and the law enforcement component of this, I think we really need to stress the prioritization of um, a technical 
uh, a technical solution to reporting. If there's going to be additional reporting needed um, from a tracking side of this on boats, there is no reason that that tracking uh, component does not have a reporting side of this to make it easier and less cost coming back to the state. Um, I think it would help offset a lot of those costs. Uh, to that point, I think Megan's going to get into that under the next agenda item. So that, that's about as fast uh, action as I can orchestrate. <clears throat> uh, okay, so anything else? Like, there's no action required at this point. The subcommittee is going to meet again. I think the total cost for the meeting was four pizzas uh, <clears throat> and, and Megan's travel. But uh, four pizzas was a fairly uh, modest uh, sum to invest in this. And I just make a personal comment. having. Having attended the TRT meeting uh, last week, um, uh, I, I came away from that meeting, I'm, I'm always amazed when I come away from the, those meetings in terms of how that process works or doesn't work. Uh, but uh, the one thing I think that this subcommittee has to deal with is uh, that uh, Megan put some polite language on the board about dealing with the excesses uh, in the system, and uh, I would put in that category dealing with some of the latency in the in the system and and the number of vertical lines. Uh, we're dangerously close, and there were a number of people around this table that attended the same meeting. We're dangerously close to having a few accidental, unintended takes uh, trigger some type of uh, legal action. And I think we would be well served by trying to address those excesses in the system before the courts do it. Uh, so I, I would hope that the subcommittee will have more discussion on that subject when it comes up. Dennis. Anyone, anyone else at the table? Okay, so we're going to move on to the next uh, agenda item, uh, which is an update on the development of Lobster da uh, Addendum uh, 26. Megan. All right, Pat, you set me up pretty well for this here. Um, so in January, the board did initiate Addendum 26 to improve harvester reporting and biological data collection in state and federal waters. So I just wanted to provide an update on that. Um, we have also been working on 25, so 26 is not ready for our board consideration today. But my hope is to get a solid draft of that perhaps by August. Um, the TC is continuing to work on determining a statistically valid sample of reporting, um, and they're also looking and evaluating the current biological sampling programs offshore to identify areas where data is either missing or potential possibilities for collaboration. Um, I think some of the things that are going to determine the timing of this addendum are the TC's analysis, the workload of the PDT, and also any action that happens on addendum 25 today. But one of the things that would be really helpful in moving this process along is to get members on the PDT who are um, well versed in electronic reporting and electronic tracking. Um, that is not an expertise I claim to have and it would be really helpful to get someone or a couple people on the PDT who have that information and can help provide some guidance on where to go. So my ask of the board today is if it's okay to reshuffle the PDT a bit for this addendum to get that expertise in the group. Um, and if people have specific individuals in mind that fit that bill and are willing to help out with this addendum, please let me know. I'm happy to talk with them to let them know what the time commitment would be um, and hopefully convince them that this is a good use of their time. Um, so if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer that or if there's any concerns. Questions for Megan? Any questions? No hands up. Uh, any objection to, oh, excuse me, Emerson. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Megan, thank you for your update. Um, what was it that you said you wanted um, expertise on um, electronic reporting and, and what else, please? And tracking, so things like VMS or other beacons that track, you know, where ships are, vessels are at certain times. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Um, 
Any other questions here? Okay, so this is uh, another issue like the prior issue, which is going to be developed, uh, and it'll come back to you uh, with more specifics. And I, I failed to note under the prior agenda item that after we get that, um, the next report from that subcommittee, at that point, I think we've got to decide whether or not we want to proceed with an addendum, uh, the development of an addendum and, and basically tasks of PDT. So the just so everyone's clear on process on that prior issue, uh, we'll get the report. If people like what they see in general, then we'll pass a motion to initiate uh, addendum 27 uh, to uh, do that. So any, any other business under this item? If not, we're going to move on to addendum 25, which is a main order of business for the, for the uh, um, meeting. This uh, uh, addenda uh, has been under develop, development, I think, as everybody knows here, uh, for a considerable period of time. The board's had numerous discussions about this. We developed objectives for it. Uh, well, and, and so that everybody understands the process that I intend to follow on this, we're going to listen to these uh, reports, uh, and then we'll then uh, once the reports are over, it's my expectation that that uh, I'm being optimistic here that that we'll have at least a half hour where we can get into some of the substance of the of the uh, addendum and what I intend to do is to try to take some of the easy, uh, easier issues uh, today uh, and I would characterize those as um, the issue of how to handle a recreational fishery, uh, the issue of uh, standardizing regulations, uh, the, um, the issue of the, the line for Area 3 and the issue of uh, de minimis. I think the other items in the addendum are fairly complex and there's going to be a lot of discussion about it. And one of the things that I, I do want to forewarn everyone that I'm going to do this before we break, uh, I'm going to take about a two or three minute caucus and allow all the states to, to caucus with your representatives. And then I, what I would like to do is to go around the table uh, and basically ask each of the jurisdictions to state uh, what their initial position is relative to the size of the cut and, and the uh, management tools that can, can be used. And the reason, reason I want to do that is that uh, w we have the benefit of uh, a couple of dozen industry people here. And I think you're going to, once, once everyone hears everyone else's initial position, they can talk to their industry, you can talk among yourself tonight and try to figure out if there's common ground among the, the positions or whether or not uh, we should uh, consider other alternatives uh, in the morning. So uh, we'll do that right prior uh, to the point where we break. And I would just point out, this does not obligate anybody to take that position in the morning. You have the ability to change your position uh, between uh, the time we recess and the time you come back. It's just, uh, what I'm trying to do is promote a dialogue among the individuals at this table and in the audience, that's all. So uh, let's start with a report, uh, um, Megan, on the options. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so the board is scheduled to take action today. Uh, for an overview of this presentation, first I'm just going to review the timeline for this addendum so the board knows what to expect after today's meeting. Um, I'll go into the public comment summary and also use that as an opportunity to review the management alternatives. And then we have several committee reports from our advisory panel, our law enforcement committee, and our technical committee. And then we'll move into board discussion and action. So a review of the timeline, the board did initiate Addendum 25 in May of 2016. In January 2017, the board approved Draft Addendum 25 for public comment, and this meant our public comment period was from mid-February to early April. Um, the board is scheduled to select management measures today, including a in, uh, potential increase in the target 
egg production. Um, in June, uh, pending the board's decision, we would ask LCMTs to submit final proposals on how to achieve the target increase in egg production, and this will allow the board to hopefully review and approve these proposals at the August board meeting. So again, just to kind of take a step back here and remind ourselves of how this all began. Um, this was prompted by the results of the 2015 stock assessment, which found that the Southern New England stock is depleted with record low abundance, spawning stock biomass, and recruitment. Uh, the figure here is showing abundance in millions of lobsters, and you can see in 2013, which was the terminal year of the assessment, it was well below the target and the threshold. In our toolbox for this uh, addendum, we are considering three management tools. The first is a gauge size change, um, and I think overall there's probably the greatest confidence in this tool to produce increases in egg production, given that it's enforceable and provides a direct benefit of keeping lobsters in the water longer. Analysis suggests that it can achieve up to a 60% increase in egg production. The second tool is trap reductions, and analysis here suggests that a 25% active trap reduction may result in, at most, a 13.1% increase in egg production. However, the technical committee has noted that the relationship between fish, traps fished and fishing mortality is unclear, and they've noted several caveats with the analysis, notably that current trap reductions reduce total allocations, not active traps, that fishermen may not maintain constant soak times, that it assumes all changes in exploitation are from trap reductions, and that there is currently a trap transferability program in areas two and three, which allows active fishermen to replace uh, cut traps with purchase traps. The third management tool is season closures, and the intent of this is to reduce pressure on the stock at vulnerable times. Analysis suggests that a quarterly season closure can achieve up to a 21.6% increase in egg production. However, this assumes that fishermen don't increase effort during an open season. So moving into our public comment summary, seven public hearings were held in six states, and in total, 235 individuals attended those hearings. We also received 145 written comments from organizations and individuals. 49 of these were from a recreational form letter. I kind of wanted to go over the general themes of the public comments because I think there were some clear themes that emerged when reviewing them, and I think maybe this will help provide an overview of what I heard at least. <clears throat> the vast majority were in support of status quo, and many commented that the board should wait for a current management program to work. Um, they noted the ongoing trap reductions in areas two and three, as well as the recent changes in 2014. Others pointed to a lack of data in the Southern New England stock and recommended that the board rectify this problem before taking further action. Many noted that natural mortality has increased and pointed to things such as predation and water quality as the primary factors which are contributing to the stock decline. Others noted the economic impacts of the proposed changes, noting that it will put fishermen out of business, and there were concerns about interstate commerce. And then many, at many of the public hearings, um, I heard that there are separate areas in the southern New England stock. So the Delmarva fishermen noted that that fishery is separate from southern New England. And area four, they said that they should be evaluated on their own. Um, I heard that Long Island Sound is its own area, and it's different from the ocean. And then I also had requests from Martha's Vineyard fishermen to, for them to be separated from the rest of area two. So our first issue is the target increase in egg production. And the question here is what should our increase in egg production be? Um, as previously noted, the vast majority were in favor of status quo, so that's a 0% increase in egg production. Many stated that predation from black sea bass, dogfish, and seals, as well as shell disease and water quality issues are the source of the southern New England decline, and that the board should address these issues before addressing fishing mortality. Others highlighted the potential economic impacts of this draft addendum, including impacts to the commercial fishery, recreational fishery, dealers, restaurants, and dive shops. 
Several fishermen stated that there had already been significant reductions in effort in southern New England fishery and further reductions are not needed. In Massachusetts and Rhode Island, many commented that their preferred management alternative is status quo. However, if the board feels it needs to take action, then the increase in egg production should be no more than 20%, and they ask that that 20% be implemented over two years. We did have a few individuals who supported a 20% increase in egg production, noting that the stock has declined and limited action may be warranted, but no one supported a 30, 40, or 60% increase. In terms of management tools, so this is our second issue, and it asks, asks what tools in our toolbox can be used to achieve that target increase in egg production. So the first option is that all three tools can be used. The second option is that gauge size changes and season closures can be used. And the third option is that gauge size changes can be used with limited use of trap reductions and season closures. Majority of comments did not support a regulatory change in the lobster fishery, and so they did not support any of the management tools in issue two. However, of those that did comment on this issue, the majority supported option A, since it provides the greatest flexibility to industry. Uh, many commented against a minimum gauge size change, stating it disadvantages the inshore fleet um, as larger lobsters move offshore and prevents southern New England fishermen from participating in markets which prefer smaller sized lobsters. Participants in New York, Delaware, and Maryland did not support the use of trap reduction since they commented there are few active traps in their waters. Um, and several, particularly in Long Island Sound, recommended a V-notch program be considered as a management tool in this addendum. Issue three asks how the recreational fishery should be impacted by this addendum. And our three alternatives are that the recreational fishery must abide by all management changes, the recreational fishery must only abide by season closures and gauge size changes, and then that the recreational fishery only abide by gauge size changes. The majority of comments supported that the recreational fishery abide by all management changes, um, those in favor of option A frequently stated that all participants in the fishery should be subject to the regulatory changes in Addendum 25. Uh, overall, the recreational fishery supported option C, in which they only abide by gauge size changes, and they commented that a summer closure would devastate the dive fishery and the businesses it supports. Our fourth question is how should season closures be implemented in this addendum? And we have three options. The first is that traps must be removed from the water. The second is that traps can stay in the water but there's no possession of lobster. And the third is that there's no possession of lobster but the bycatch fishery can continue. Uh, the vast majority did not support a season closure. Many commented that season closures disrupt the lobster market and decrease the efficiency of the fleet. Others commented that since the Jonah crab and lobster fisheries are now jointly managed, season closures hurt the Jonah crab fishery. Of those that did comment on this issue, the majority stated that traps should stay in the water during a season closure. They stated that traps provide food and protection to lobsters, um, and they protect historic lobster grounds from mobile gear. Others commented on the safety hazard of removing gear, particularly in the winter, and noted that there are limited places to store traps. We also had sub-options here that asked if the most restrictive rule is either applied or not applied to dual permit holders. Um, and we received few comments on this, but those who did comment did not support the application of the most restrictive rule to season closures. I did just want to kind of preview some of the questions that the board is going to have to answer on season closures. Um, and some of these are, if traps can stay in the water, is it just traps which are permitted for another species or all lobster traps? Does Jonah crab count as another permitted species? Is there a way to tell the difference between those traps which exclusively catch lobster and those which catch conch or black sea bass? What about the Atlantic large whale take reduction team rule which pro uh, prohibits uh, wet storage of gear for more than 30 days? Can there be a grace period during which fishermen can remove and set traps? And does the most restrictive rule apply? 
So just to kind of preview these questions, when we get motions on season closures, we're gonna to have to be very specific um, in crafting those motions to try and answer these questions. Our fifth issue is standardized regulations. So this asks whether management uh, regulations have to be standardized between different LCMAs. And we have three options. The first is that they don't have to be standardized. The second is that areas four and five have to be standardized. And the third option is that areas two, four, five, and six have to be standardized. The majority of comments did not support the standardization of regulations. Many stated that LCMAs were created to reflect regional differences in the fishery and that each LCMA should have the independence to make its own decision. Uh, we did have a couple that supported standardized regulations between areas four and five, and they generally noted that both of these areas uh, span New Jersey. Our sixth issue is in regards to the implementation of this addendum in area three. And this question is prompted because area three spans both the Gulf of Maine, Georgia's bank stock, as well as the Southern New England stock. Um, we had different options here. Option A was to keep area three as a whole unit. Options B, C, and D were all variations on how to split area three. Uh, the majority of comments did not support splitting area three. Um, they cautioned the board against unintended consequences, such as the migration of effort to the Gulf of Maine, Georgia's bank stock, and the devaluation of area three permits. There were a couple who are in favor of splitting Area 3, and they generally stated that it's unfair to burden fishermen in the Gulf of Maine, Georgia's bank stock. And then our final issue is issue seven, which asks which management changes de minimis states have to abide by. Um, our first option is that de minimis states are not exempt from the ma uh, regulatory changes in this addendum, and option B is that the de minimis states are exempt. Um, overall, there was a slight majority in favor of de minimis states being exempt, and this primarily came from Delmarva fishermen who supported an exemption for de minimis states, but did express concern that the language in Addendum 25 could hinder future growth of the fishery. Um, some also recommended that all of Area 5 be given de minimis status. Uh, those who opposed an exemption for the de, minim de minimis states commented that the regulatory changes should be equally applied to everyone. And then finally, just to wrap up on some of the other comments we received, um, several people commented that there should be an increase in quota for predator species such as black sea bass, that there should be a uh, federal buyout program or a reinstatement of hatchery programs. Many commented that coastwide lobster landings at a record high, and so there's no need to take management action. Others stated that there's a need for more data offshore and in the southern range of lobsters. Several people disagreed with the statement that climate change is contributing to the stock decline, and others asked that credit be given for oversized vents. And with that, that is the public comment summary. We can either take questions or move to the committee reports. Questions for Megan? Anyone? No hands up. Uh, okay. Uh, then we'll move on to the next report, which is uh, the Enforcement Committee report, AP. right? The what? Advisory panel. Yeah. AP, uh, Grant, and then we'll deal with the Enforcement uh, Committee report. <coughs> It just by way of introductions, Grant is uh, chair of the AP. He's also the chair of the LCMT3 group, and he's the uh, president of Atlantic Offshore Lobster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. David, you just stole my thunder. <clears throat> I was going to introduce myself to everybody. Um, I'm in these positions, I guess, because I've been an active fisherman for 42 years, so I think um, I can speak to uh, these issues. Uh, the AP met on uh, April 11th. Um, the first issue that we discussed was the increase in egg production. Uh, unanimously, we supported a 0% increase in egg, egg production, option A, which in reality is a 13% increase in egg production if you take in the current trap reductions that are taking place. 
Uh, members commented that the board should give time for the recent regulatory changes to take effect as fishermen saw more lobsters and eggers in 2016. Two members commented that the board feels the need to, if the board feels the need to take action, there should be no more than a 20 percent increase. Uh, another member noted that there is nothing which prohibits the board from considering an increase that is less than 20 percent, such as 10 percent, 11 percent, or whatever the board would choose. This AP member also commented that the board chooses an option other than status quo. Current trap production should cover the egg production increase in LCMA 2 and 3. Another member commented that with the continuation of the current trap productions, status quo will result in a greater than a 0% increase, as I stated at the start here. Uh, moving on to issue two, the management tools, the AP reiterated its desire for status quo. Uh, four members supported option A, which allows for the gauge size changes, seasonal closures, trap productions to all be used independently or in conjunction with one another. Those who supported option A stated that it provides the greatest flexibility to the industry. Two members commented that anything other than the currently scheduled trap reductions in LCMA 2 will kill the industry. They noted that an increase in the minimum size in area 2 will shut down the fishery because the larger lobsters migrate offshore. Another member commented that increasing the minimum gauge size in area 3 will prevent the offshore fishery from participating in markets which require smaller grade lobsters. One member uh, commented that any of the management tools proposed in this addendum will permanently shut down the LCMA 6 lobster fishery. He noted the changes to the gauge size will only further exacer exacerbate interstate commerce issues with Maine and LCMA 6. Um, they already have a seasonal closure in September. Uh, he supported a V-notch program, which was interesting as the management tool to achieve increases in egg production. Um, I'm sorry to be lengthy, but I want to make sure that I, I include everybody's comments here. Uh, one member commented that if the climate change is truly the cause of the southern New England stock decline, why make any management changes? Given that scientists are predicting continued warming in the coming years and the board cannot control the ocean temperatures. I'm going to move on to the next slide, please. The recreational fishery, the advisory panel was not unanimous in its recommendation regarding the recreational fishery. Four members supported option A, which requires the recreational fishery to abide by uh, any management changes in the addendum. They commented that whatever changes are applied to one portion of the fishery should be equally applied to all sectors of the fishery. One member supported option B, which required the recre fi recreational fishery to abide by gauge size changes and seasonal closures. He commented that this option is closest to status quo. One member supported option C, which the recreational fishery only abides by the gauge size change. He said that a summer closure would be detrimental to the recreational fishery since they are limited to the summer months when the weather is more amenable, amenable to the diving. <coughs> Excuse me. Seasonal closures. Uh, we were unanimous in its recommendation that the most restrictive rule does not apply to seasonal closures, sub-option 2. Two members su supported option A, which allows the traps to stay in the water but pro prohibits the possession of lobsters during a seasonal closure. One member supported option C, which allows the traps to stay in the water and permits non-trap gears to continue to land lobsters under the bycatch limit. He commented that the option C allows Jonah Crab fishery to continue while providing a small market for the bycatch of lobsters. Next slide, please. Standardization of the regulations. Um, five members supported the option A, which does not, support, uh, does not require the standardization of the management measures across all LCMAs. They commented that the purpose of uh, lobster LCMAs is to reflect regional differences in the fishery and standardized regulations will negatively impact the industry. One member commented that if the regulations are going to be standardized, they need to be uniform along the entire coast, including Maine. One member supported option B, which standardizes the regulations in LCMAs 4 and 5, and he, his comment was given New Jersey straddles two LCMAs, differences in the regulations between LCMAs 4 and 5 cause confusion in the recreational fishery. Um, Issue six, the implementation of the management measures in LCMA 3. Three members chose not to comment on this issue, stating that the LCMA 3 should be allowed to decide how to deal with this issue. One member supported option A, which maintains LCMA 
um, uh, three is a single area. Commented that the industry is concerned about the migration of effort into the Gulf of Maine and Georgia's bank stock, as well as a devaluation of an LCMA 3 permit. If the area is split along the 70 degree west line, another member commented that there is no resource issue. Uh, another member commented that there is no resource issue in LCMA 3, meaning the Gulf of Maine, Georgia's bank, and there is no need to change the regulations in the offshore area. He also noted that the recent National Monument and Deep Sea Coral Amendments are providing additional protection to lobster stocks in this area. Uh, issue 7. Uh, de minimis, uh, two members supported option B, which exempts de minimis states from implementing the regulatory changes resulting from this addendum in state waters. Uh, one of these members requested that the exemption be extended into federal waters. Another member supported option A, which requires de minimis states to implement the regulatory changes in this addendum. Um, his comment was that any management changes should apply to all, all participants in the fishery. Um, we had some general comments, um, with your per permission. Um, one member commented that the sport dive fishery is limited to the summer months and asked the board to avoid a summer season closure. Also commented that predation is the primary contributor to the lobster stock decline and that the board needs to pursue increases in quota for dogfish and black sea bass. Another member stated that industry is united in its support for status quo and the addendum should be stalled until new data is, a, <clears throat> is added to the addendum or the addendum is rewritten to address natural mortality. The comment was that the increase in black sea bass population will hurt any progress made in this addendum and also noted that there is no information regarding the cultural or tourism aspects of the lobster fishery nor the indirect economic consequences that could result from this addendum. Um, he disagreed with the natural mortality line in figure three of draft addendum 25 commenting that natural mortality has increased significantly in the last few years. Um, another member commented that the current approach to managing lobsters is not working. He expressed concern about increase in black sea bass population in New Eng England. Another member reiterated his support for status quo and commented that the industry is doing enough to protect the lobster stock. Another member commented that the board, <clears throat> if the board makes the wrong decision on draft addendum 25, it will finish the LCMA 2 inshore fishery, which is the last remaining viable inshore fishery in southern New England. Large reductions will result in the loss of the infrastructure docks, which once gone cannot be gained back due to the prevalence of coastal development, and also noted that it takes 10 years to, the, to see the results of management measures that have already been in, put in place due to the slow growth of lobsters. As a result, um, he felt that the board should give time for the benefits of the recent management measures, uh, management changes to come to, to fruition. And lastly, one member echoed the comments that the board's decision in this addendum could seriously hinder the future of the lobster fishery. His, his comment was the lobster fishery is moving offshore, but commented that it is not up to AFCMSC to dictate how this happens or when fishing is no longer economically viable. He stated that industry has done a lot to protect the resource, and we question whether anything will good, anything of good will come out of this addendum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, so uh, questions for Grant? Any questions? If not, we're going to uh, Pete Burns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Grant, for that report. That was really informative. I was just wondering if uh, the AP had ever considered, uh, they talked about uh, the impacts of increasing the minimum size, but did they discuss um, the possibility of decreasing the maximum size as a conservation measure? Um, that was brought up, uh, Peter. Um, basically, with, with the information provided by the technical committee, to gain any significant percentage change in egg production, we were looking at a four and a half maximum, a four and a half inch maximum size in southern New England. By going to that, um, the AP felt that uh, we'd be creating a slot fishery, which is not a viable option. Any follow-up, Peter? No, thank you. All right. Any other questions? Grant. Okay, thank you very much, Grant. Um, <clears throat> so the next report we have is the Enforcement Committee report. Renee?
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Law Enforcement Committee of the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission reviewed management options contained in the American Lobster Draft Amendment 25 during a teleconference meeting on March, 20, on March 17, 2017. North Carolina, Rhode Island, Florida, Maine, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, Virginia, Maryland, Georgia, Delaware, U.S. Coast Guard, and NOAA OLE participated in the teleconference. A copy of this memo has been provided to the board. Issue one, target increase in egg production. The LS LEC has no comments or recommendations on this issue. Issue two, management tools. The LEC did not make a recommendation specific to the three options presented in the draft addendum. It cautions, however, that trap reductions as a management tool is likely to be ineffective because of enforceability problems with off offshore fisheries where the increasing effort in the fishery is occurring. There can be no meaningful enforcement of trap limits without electronic tracking or the development of a significant, significant offshore enforcement platform. Other recommendations regarding gauge size changes, gauge size changes or seasonal closures are included later in this memorandum. Issue three, recreational fishery. The LEC strongly supports consistency across the board between recreational and commercial management measures, particularly with respect to gauge size. The LEC re recommends that if a commercial season closure is implemented, at the least a strict minimum recreational bag limit be applied and enforced. Because states typically allow a smaller number of recreational, recreational traps per person, consistency with commercial trap reductions seems less critical. Issue four, season closures. The LEC supports option A and recommends that lobster traps be removed from the water during closed season. The LEC supports sub-option sub A, requiring the most restrictive rule to apply to season closures if a fisherman is authorized to fish in more than one LCMA. The LC EC recognized the potential impact this would have on Jonah and Welk harvest, Jonah crab and Welk harvest, but believes that leaving traps in the water will reduce the effectiveness of a seasonal closure through continued trapping and mortality of lobsters. Economic incentives to retrieve inland lobsters illegally during the closed season, increased number of lost and derelict traps, and increased likelihood of whale entanglements are some of the LEC's concerns. Issue five, uniform regulations. The LEC strongly reaffirms its long-standing recommendations for consistency and uniform regulations. Inconsistent regulations with a most restrictive, require, most restrictive requirement may be of some help, but once the product leaves the dock, the least restrictive re regulation becomes the enforceable standard. Regulatory inconsistencies decrease the likelihood of successful prosecutions. Issue six, management LCMA3. Management measures in LCMA3. The LEC recommend it, recommends option A, status quo, in light of the significant existing problems with offshore enforcement. Until enforcement tools for monitoring and checking the offshore lobster trap fishery are enhanced, Adopting a zonal split in LCMA3 with its attendant trap tag and transit complications would, would depend most entirely on voluntary compliance. Issue seven, de minimis states, the LEC did not comment on this issue. The LEC appreciates the opportunity to provide enforcement advice to the American Lobster Management Board during, regarding draft amendment 25. Thank you, Renee. Uh, question for Renee. Any questions? No hands up. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So now we're you know, into the. Oh, excuse me. TC. Oh, excuse me. We uh, missed a report. TC report. Kathleen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we didn't necessarily meet on the addendum, but we did want to respond to comments um, from the January board meeting and some of the public comments. Um, so we wrote a memo that's included in the meeting materials restating our previous analyses. 
Um, first, we wanted to confirm that the trap reduction analysis was based on the number of active traps, and that was estimated by the 2015 stock assessment. Um, second, due to a number of uncertainties, we'd like to reiterate that the analysis predicts, the trap reduction um, analysis predicts at most a 13% increase in egg production in response to a 25% active trap reduction. With that said, we had the greatest confidence in predicted egg production increases from a gauge size change. And we also wanted to note that the benefit of these management actions may be less if there are disparate regulations across management areas. The analyses were done on the stock level, um, not on the LCMA level. Different actions implemented to reach the target percentage may not be realistic based on smaller spatial resolutions and different management types. Thank you. All right, questions for Kathleen. Any questions? Uh, if not, uh, Pete Burns. Kathleen, thanks a lot for the report. And just to uh, touch on the trap reduction issue, so it's, it's clear then that um, if the way that we're reducing traps now would apply to both latent and active effort because it's applying, being applied across um, every fisherman's allocation. And so in that case, you wouldn't expect to get um, any reduction in fishing mortality based on removing latent effort. Is that true? Yes, that is true. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, no hands up. So do we have any more reports that I've missed? <laughs> uh, okay, so we're through our, our reports. So at this juncture, I, I think we need to get into the actual addendum and what I indicated before. Uh, I want to uh, take some of the, we've got, uh, I think Bob Beal recommended that we break about five, is that correct, Bob? 5.15, so we've got uh, 35 minutes, 40 minutes to get into some of these issues. Uh, my suggestion is that we take up um, some of the issues that, at least in my own case, I view as the low-hanging fruit uh, on the tree, the, the less difficult uh, issues. And what I would like to do is start off with uh, the issue of the recreational fishery uh, and, and basically um, deal with the options. So Megan, can you put the options up on the screen? Have you got that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Put the options up and what I'd like to do is uh, open up for discussion after we have a little bit of discussion and ask for a motion on this. So anyone care to discuss uh, recreational options? Uh, the, if you have your addendum, these are on page 25. Uh, and you basically have three options uh, in the addendum. Discussion. You heard the Enforcement Committee report uh, in, uh, with, that dealt with this issue directly. Anyone want to make a comment? No comments. Anyone want to make a motion on this? Mark? I just have a question. Go uh, ahead. It says if recreational fishery under option A must abide by uh, trap reductions taken in Denim 25, there, there are no trap reductions. There are, Megan, to that point, and then I'll comment. Yeah, it would be any additional trap reductions that are implemented as a result of this. So, for example, if trap reductions are one of the tools that remain in the toolbox um, in Area 6, wanted to pursue trap reductions, then your recreational fishermen would also have to abide by those. And I don't believe all states have trap numbers. I think some of them are lobster uh, bag limits. So another thing to think about. And that, that was going to be my question. Do all states have trap limits on the recreational fishery? I see a number of heads saying no. Um, Dan? I believe we all do have trap limits among the states. Do you want to poll the states on that issue now? Well, I think that's a good suggestion. How many states have, have trap uh, uh, limits on the recreational fishery? Just raise your hand. 
Okay, so there are, um, as I understand it, uh, there are a number of mid-Atlantic states that do not have trap uh, limits, which uh, raises an interesting question. If they don't have a trap limit, how do you reduce them? Um, uh, so uh, this, this problem, I think, is going to come up a couple of times during the discussions uh, today uh, and tomorrow. I think there are uh, a couple of other instances where, depending upon the option that gets selected, um, uh, some aspects of the fishery essentially will be held harmless. And this may be one of the cases. Dan. David, thank you. Um, to me, this is where the de minimis proposal really missed the mark, because I'm guessing that the states that don't have trap limits don't have fisheries in their state waters. And so I'm sure if the states, you know, New Jersey or South or wherever the fishery doesn't exist anymore in any degree in state waters, and they ask for de minimis status for their rec fishery, we'd all give it to them. Because what we all know about the lobster stock in, in the, to the south is that it's moved offshore. So I think it's kind of a non-issue. Okay, which raises the question, how do we, how do we want to handle this? We, we want to, I mean, we've only got three options in the, in the uh, document. Um, so um, comments, Dan. I would say we'd go uh, with option A with a, a sub-option or, or an option for de minimis status that states could request de minimis status on aspects of this. So if Delaware says I, I need de minimis status on my intro lobster fishery which doesn't exist for recreational fishermen, we'd give it to them. Okay. So you've heard that suggestion's comments to that suggestion, Eric. Thank you, Mr. Then Chair. John Dean. <clears throat> You should have picked the minimus first, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I want to know what the legal advice is on de minimis. Has no has no general counsel looked at de minimis status? Uh, de minimis in the in the case of uh, would, there's no dialogue in the to be blunt there's no dialogue in the document about de minimis for recreational fisheries, although. It's probably within the purview of the board if there's no fishery, recreational fishery. De minimis was discussed uh, um, in the document uh, as, it, as it pertained to the Mid-Atlantic proposal. Um, uh, and I don't, uh, I mean, Peter, do you want to comment on that? Uh, it's not necessary if you don't want to. But if you want to, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I can't speak for general counsel. I'm not an attorney, certainly, but I think, uh, I think you're right. I think that uh, within the context of this addendum, it was really only talked about within, uh, within the proposal that came up for exemptions um, under what's in addendum 25 for the regular fishery. So I'm not quite sure how it would pertain here. I, I know that, you know, de minimis is a state issue, really, not, a, uh, not necessarily a federal one. Yeah, my suggestion here is we deal with the options on the table, and then depending upon which option uh, uh, gets approved, then we can have some dialogue and discussion. I mean, and I'll just follow Dan's suggestion. If the mid-Atlantic states don't have recreational fisheries in their water waters, there's, there's no possibility for um, having them reduce a trap limit. So that concept may have merit. Um, but uh, let's, let's uh, further discussion on this. Always nice to have the wheels fall off the cart on the, on the first issue. <laughs> Doug. Well, I'm not Southern New England, but I, I uh, asked the states that would have to implement this, you know, what are their recreational trap restrictions? And think about if there are anything similar to what's in New Hampshire, what are you really going to gain in egg production by having a reduction in the relatively small amount of traps that they're allowed? Now, maybe some states have recreational um, trap limits that are quite sizable, but I'd, I'd be surprised at that. 
it's, uh, I'm all, from my perspective, if it was happening in, in New Hampshire, I would say stick with gauge size and season closures because you're not going to gain anything from trap reductions in, in increasing your egg production. And I, I, again, I offer that up to Rhode Island and Connecticut and Massachusetts and the states of the south as to what their trap size is. And just to follow up on that, I just remind everybody, as, as I said when we started to open the dialogue, when we met in Connecticut, uh, we actually discussed certain aspects of this, and the consensus was that all groups uh, within the southern New England stock area should contribute something. And I'm not saying that to disagree with the chairman of the commission, but and I think that was the context for putting uh, these options in the document. In other words, they're, they're, uh, if, if the commercial fishermen have to give up traps, then, then maybe the recreational fishermen should give up traps. That was a concept. All right, Dan. Is, it too, is it too early Matt? for a motion? Yeah, I'm ready for a motion. Um, move to... Um, consider or to adopt option B, which is the recreational fishery must abide by gauge sizes and season closures. All right, is there a second? Seconded by Mark Gibson. Discussion on a motion. Uh, I've got, uh, let's see, uh, Adam, then Pat. Right. Go ahead. Yeah. Tom Foti. Thank you. Our recreational lobster fishery, if you will, in New Jersey is essentially limited almost exclusively to our diving community. We do have a recreational trap limit of 10 pots per person. Um, I could go every day that I've fished and never see a recreational trap all year very, very limited. Uh, to have a seasonal closure during our prime diving seasons would be devastating to the diving community, quite frankly. Uh, it's the one issue at our public hearing that the recreational interest came out and spoke out about passionately to limit the changes to gauge size only and for that reason I would move to amend to remove the seasonal closures Mr. Chairman. All right is there a second to a motion to amend? A second? No second. The uh, motion dies due to lack of a second. Tom Foti. I was just going to say the same thing Adam says our fisheries in July and August and it's mostly a dive fishery. I don't even know how many pot, I, I, for the first time I realized that we did have, able to have 10 recreational pots, but that's not really a big fishery. What we have is the dive fishery. And it's, you know, it's something when they go out and dive a wreck and they want to grab a lobster. So we have a season closer in July and August that puts all those people out of business. And I'm not about to do that when it makes no difference to the stock. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to go back to Adam's point and just make sure that everyone understands this. The, the, the intent of the motion, uh, at least the in, intent of the option in the document, is not to pick uh, either gauge sizes or, or season closures. That, that is yet to be decided, and it will probably be decided on an area-by-area -area basis. All this basically says is that uh, if that option is selected, then they have to, to uh, abide by it. But for instance, if uh, New Jersey chose a gauge size, uh, then there would be no season closure. Other discussion on the, on the motion on the floor? Yes, Roy. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, um, I think I would offer a, a second to the motion proposed by New Jersey just for voting purposes. Um, too late. If somebody wants to make that motion again, they can do that, but I'm going to rule it too late. 
Uh, further discussion? Tom Foti. I'll make Adam's motion again. Okay, so we have a motion by Tom Foti, seconded by Roy Miller. Uh, and the motion specifically, Tom? Is remove the season closures. It's up there. All right, does everybody understand the motion on the table? Discussion? Any discussion? Yeah, the second by Roy. Any discussion? No discussion. Pete Burns. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'm just curious um, what the impact would be on uh, uh, what's the, how big is the recreational dive fishery in New Jersey and, and when does it operate? Someone want to comment on that? Tom. Thank you. I, I don't know how large it is, but ports from Cape May, Point Pleasant, um, even up in Sandy Hook, there's usually uh, dive boats to like a charter operation. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but but it is it, do, it will affect them se severely. And their their main seasons of business is during the summer months, June through September, probably. Um, so it is it is popular <coughs> sport. It is popular, and we. You know, as evidenced by our public hearing, uh, the New Jersey Dive Council was represented there. I'm not sure of their numbers, but it is quite significant. Can I follow? And, and Tom, uh, mm -hmm. ahead, Tom, Tom I'm, I'm going to finish up. One, one of the other issues we'll deal with later is the, the management tools. So, as I understand it, if there's a gauge size increase, could there also be a season closure? You can use them together. So that would affect yeah. our recreational fishery. Yeah, it, and that was the point that I was making. It may or may not be needed uh, is the reality of it. Tom Foti. Yeah, and those dive boats are mainly going out in wrecks. They're just diving. And some of the guys like to get lobsters while they're down there, but I don't think that's really what the dive trips are sold for. They're not just sold to go out and harvest, but they're going to a particular wreck to observe and everything else. So it's just a, a bycatch of the operation that they can come up with a lobster or so. I don't know what the figures are. We could basically try and figure that out, but it, it's difficult. All right. Uh, anyone on the motion to amend, which basically removes the seasonal closure? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So if the dive, divers are primarily diving in July and August and they don't want to lose that, would they be open to a seasonal closure at the opposite times of the year? Uh, you know, sometimes we have to balance these things out somehow. Anyone in the New Jersey delegation want to respond? Adam? Sure, it's great to go ahead and just look at the sea life on the bottom and then decompress, hang out for a while, and swim back to the surface. But having that opportunity to harvest a bug or two, take home that lobster, people want that opportunity. The dive boats need that opportunity, sure. January, February, March, is there less diving activity due to water temperature? Absolutely. But it doesn't go completely to zero. And I'm not sure those months would even provide much in the way of benefit at that time. All right. Uh, anyone else at the table? Uh, do you want to caucus? Anyone want to caucus on this? Take a one minute caucus, and then I'm going to call a vote. Pete Burns. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just, I guess, I'm thinking about how this would translate, you know, sort of north to south, because I, even though New Jersey's uh, recreational fishery is mostly rooted in the dive fishery, how would it translate in some of the New England states that have those recreational fisheries? And then you'd potentially be allowing um, fishermen to fish and have lobsters in, not in commerce, but landed during a, during a seasonal closure. So th those, I think those would be my my concerns. I'm not sure if, the, if uh, Renee on the Law Enforcement Committee wants to make a comment. Michael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was also thinking kind of the same way that, uh, that Pete is, just as far as 
you know, we're, we're speaking of our recreational fishery down in Delmarva, and ours is even smaller than what New Jersey has. Um, a handful of boats, they do a little diving, catch a few, catch a few lobster. Um, and I guess, so I've, I'm going to support the, the motion to amend here because I th we haven't made the, the decisions that we're going to be making tomorrow to understand kind of where we might be as far as is, is Area 4 going to be linked together with Area 5? Are we going to have management tools that are going to be linked together with mandatory seasonal closures? And without knowing all of that, I think this is the, this is the most, the, less, the least amount of impact to those very, very small fisheries in, in, in the southern extent of um, southern New England. So I will support the motion to amend. Anyone else? Uh, so one minute caucus, and then I'll call a vote. All right, uh, I'm going to call a vote. Is everybody ready? I don't want to. I don't want to rush this. <laughs> the, everyone ready for a, a vote here? All those in favor, uh, signify by raising your right hand and hold your hands up, please. Six in favor. Opposed. Three opposed, four opposed. Uh, any uh, abstentions? One abstention, two abstention, null votes. Okay, so the motion passes. Uh, so you have an amended motion on the floor. Any further discussion on the amended motion? Yes, Mark. A question. If option B is selected, that wouldn't preclude a state from considering trap reductions in the recreational fishery and taking credit for it, would it? I think the uh, state could, and Megan correct this if this is wrong, I think under conservation equivalency you could certainly propose that. Do you agree? Um, I would say the state can always be more conservative than what the plan specifies. I would have to think if that could count towards your egg production target or not. Um, I need to think about that. I don't want to give an answer right now. Okay, other questions? Yes, John. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just looking at the options by taking out the season. Isn't this now option C, the motion? Yes, that's correct. Thank you for that observation. <laughs> And not only did the wheels fall off, <laughs> I won't go there. Uh, okay, so uh, all those in favor of the uh, amended motion, uh, signify by raising your right hand. Nine. Nine. So we get nine in favor of post. One opposed, uh, abstentions, one abstention, null votes, any null votes, two, two abstentions, I should say. Uh, no null votes, so motion passes. Congratulations, first issue down. <clears throat> you, can, you can take a deep breath, it'll go a lot easier uh, until we get to uh, the next item on the agenda, <laughs> which is, um, Standardizing regulations. This is item number five. Uh, what page? I'm page 26. And M Megan, have you got the options?
Okay, so um, we have a couple of different, three different options here. I just remind everybody that the overwhelming public comment uh, in the public hearings was for option A, the advisory uh, committee uh, r recommended option A. Uh, so discussion on this, any discussion? No discussion, someone want to make a motion? <coughs> Mark Gibson. <clears throat> yes, I would move uh, under issue five, uniform regulations, that the board adopt option A regulations are not uniform across LCMAs, the status quo. Do I have a, a second to the motion? John Clark. Discussion on the motion? Any discussion? Uh, no hands up. Uh, you need a caucus on this? Anyone need a caucus? No caucus? Okay, all those in favor of the motion on the board uh, signify by raising your hand. Eleven in favor, uh, no, no votes, no, no no's, uh, any abstentions, any null votes. Motion carries. Just get right in the swing of things here. It, hey, it, David, that, can we pause for one second? We had a technical difficulty, and we just want to catch up with you on the screen. Okay. Two seconds. Um, All right, the, the next issue we're going to deal with is, is the line in uh, LCM, uh, the LCMT3 or, or uh, LMA3. Uh, this is a 70 degree line. And just by way of background, I was going to say this before, but I, uh, I, and I, I'm not trying to convince anybody to do one, uh, follow one path or another path. I just think it's for useful to reflect on the history here. When, when we got involved in this uh, addendum, the, the industry, some segments of the Area 3 industry basically came forward and said, uh, this will be a disaster uh, for the, the offshore boats that fish uh, out on Georgia's and in the Gulf of Maine, uh, if there isn't a line. Uh, and they voiced a concern, uh, they also voiced a concern that there was a substantial uh, tendency among the offshore boats to, in Area 3, to fish uh, both west of that line uh, for crab fishing, Jonah crab fishing purposes, primarily, I think, in February uh, and March, uh, and uh, then uh, move to the east. So the impact, I, I want everybody to clearly understand this, that the impact of no line, you have two stocks in, that are harvested uh, in Area 3. You have the Georgia's Bank Gulf of Maine stock and, and the Southern New England stock. The Southern New England stock is west of 70 degrees. The Georgia's Bank stock is east of 70 degrees. So if the line exists, everybody should be clear on this, if the line exists, then you can impose restrictions on the southern New England uh, portion of the stock without negatively affecting the Georgia's Bank stock. If the line doesn't exist, then all Area 3 uh, fishermen have to abide by whatever restrictions the board um, uh, adopts. The, se the second issue that came up clearly in the public hearings was there was a lot of concern about um, the accumulation of gear in proximity to the line and the potential impacts uh, that this might have on whales, uh, particularly south of like Mars's Vineyard and what they refer to as uh, steamer lanes. I heard a number of fishermen raise this uh, and uh, uh, voice that concern. So there are, I want everybody to just understand, there are pros and cons of the of the line, and depending upon the, de the decision that gets made on, on the line, 
either you end up extending the regulations just in one portion of Area 3 or you extend it yeah, to the other portion of Area 3. And just so everyone's clear, the advice from the public hearings was no line, was, was the advice. So it, it's kind of a ticklish uh, issue. Uh, uh, so uh, let me ask for any discussion, any other points that people want to make on this? Uh, and uh, if they don't want to make points, somebody want to make a motion. Jim. Uh, just a question for the LEC again. So what was uh, their take on it? I'm sorry, Renee, I missed it before. The LEC, the LEC said until enforcement tools for monitoring and checking the offshore lobster trap fishery are enhanced, adopting a zonal split in LCMA3 um, would depend almost entirely on voluntary compliance. Yes, yeah, so let me, thank you, Renee. So let me reiterate, the AP recommended against the line, and the Enforcement Committee basically is, is recommending against the line. And the advice we got at public hearings was against the line. Someone care to make a motion on this issue? Uh, everybody, uh, Dan. I move to adopt option A, maintain LCMA3 as a single area. Right, is there a second to that? Seconded by Eric Reed. Uh, discussion, Jim, did you have your hand up? No? Anyone here want to speak to this? Uh, since we have the benefit of, of Grant uh, in the audi audience, um, Grant, are there any other considerations with the, which the board should know of uh, that you can think of at this point? You don't have to speak, but if there's something you think the board should know of about this issue, uh, then I'll give you an opportunity to comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the only thing I'd like to, to, to reiterate to the board is that uh, maintaining one area will put Georgia's Bank Gulf of Maine stock under the same type of restrictions that would be imposed on the southern New England. So if this board decides to adopt any measures other than the status quo, it's going to affect a perfectly healthy stock that's at record abundance at this time. So uh, I would advise just that people keep that in mind. Thank you. Doug Grout. Yeah, I will oppose this motion for that very reason, that I think we'll be implementing restrictions on uh, perfectly healthy stock, and I would support uh, a motion to have, include the line there. So I'll be voting against this. Got Emerson and then John Clark, I think you raised your yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I kind of missed it in your opening remarks here a couple minutes ago about this issue. Did you say that this establishing this line um, was brought by industry? And, and if so, then I'm wondering why um, it, it, neither in the AP or in the public comment the, the issue wasn't supported at all. I wonder if anybody yeah, has any information I, on that. I did, did say that. This, this issue was uh, originally supported because there were a few individuals in the Area 3 in, uh, industry that um, basically submitted it. Uh, but clearly, when we went to public hearing, I, I, went, I attended uh, a number of the public hearings, the Area 3 industry was almost unanimously opposed to the, to the line uh, for some of the reasons that I cited. I've got John Clark. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just had the same, uh, I was, same question pretty much. I was just curious as to why at this point now they're against it when it sounds like this would almost be a uh, poison pill for this whole addendum because, as was just stated, if this is approved and then there's any type of reduction at all in this plan, it'll apply to fishermen fishing Georgia's Bank and Gulf of Maine, correct? Uh, 
The only, the only other reason that I heard at the public hearing, John, that, uh, that came up repeatedly was there's this concern that if you establish a line at some point, that line and whatever the qualifying uh, entry uh, requirements are, uh, would be used to uh, declare, basically break area three into two areas. There was a lot of concern about that and the issue of devaluing permits. And the, the other related uh, issue uh, that came up was if you have a line, it will, the best fishing, everyone knows the best fishing is east of the line, but they generally, uh, the guys that are fishing west of the line, don't take advantage of that because they're also doing a lot of crabbing uh, uh, west of the line. So the line will force a number of fishermen in southern New England to redirect uh, into northern New England. That was another uh, issue that came up at the hearing. So I, I agree. I, I having been involved in the in the early discussions on establishing the line, I went to the public hearings and scratched my head a bit myself. Um, someone else uh, here, Steve Train. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the way this is, this motion now, I, I do not see how I can support this. We're taking a very healthy stock in the Gulf of Maine and George's Bank and forcing management measures on the participants in that. Maybe not Area 1, but Area 3, uh, but it's the same stock as Area 1 that don't need to be there by tying, by not putting that line. It, it makes absolutely no sense to me. And I wonder, is this how we submarine the whole plan and do nothing? Because I can't see forcing uh, time out of the fishery or a larger measure or, or anything else at this point for other tap, trap reductions on the healthiest fishery we have in these, these LCMAs. Other comments? Any other comments? Uh, Peter Burns. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was just wondering, I, I'm trying to remember back on what the TC uh, recommendation was on, on this, whether they recommended management by stock area or by the whole area. Kathleen. We were only looking at southern New England as a stock area. We were not looking at Georgia's Bank. Thank you. Other comments, Mike? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would it, be, would it be safe to say that in considering this issue that the uh, Area 3 fishermen are willing to deal with what may end up being a, a small reduction rather than the complications that come with the line? From what I, is it, are they, it kind of sounds like to me, I'm not quite clear on how the, you know, the industry brought it up, but then once it was analyzed, they've now decided that they don't want it anymore. But I wonder if they're if they're just willing to accept the Southern New England management because that's less impactful than what they think might happen as a result of a line. Is that a fair class? Did that, I that actually has been the way that a couple of individuals in Area 3 have characterized it exactly. You know, they, they, they think uh, those individuals who support that position basically think that you're better off not the complications that come with the line uh, are more damaging than, than just slight changes in the regulations. So, to some extent, this, this, all of these issues are linked, you know, and that's one of the reasons that I've uh, avoided not getting into issue one and two, because what you, de what you decide on some of these issues now will have a major impact on, on the decisions that get made. Uh, before, in other words, you don't really know what you're voting on with issue one and two, unless you flesh out some of these these other uh, details. Uh, further discussion on this, uh, Eric. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll paraphrase Mike Luisi. It would be safe to say that if I hadn't seconded this motion, I wouldn't have wasted the board's time. It's my understanding that th th this. This motion was conditional on status quo being adopted, so it's cart before the horse, and obviously it would do a lot more damage than good to support it now. So uh, I'm going to uh, oppose my seconded motion. <clears throat> okay. Uh, any other discussion? Right. You need a caucus? This is probably an issue where we need a caucus. A couple of minutes. <clears throat>
All right, uh, you ready or you need more time? I can see <laughs> uh, Mike asked for a little bit more time. And then I'll recognize Craig. <clears throat> All right, you re ready for the question here? I, and I'm gonna take the, the uh, extra step. I want you to hold your hands up for a lengthy period of time here so that we can write down who's voting, which way. Given the way this dialogue has gone, I could envision after tonight's discussion, somebody wanting to go back and reconsider, and it, I think it's important to know who's voting what. Dennis? I request a roll call. All right. Thank you. Craig, Craig excuse me. Uh, so that was going to be my question. Uh, depending on what happens, uh, I guess, today, and then what might happen tomorrow, would it be uh, within our rules to reconsider this question, depending on the outcome tomorrow? A absolutely. Thank you. That's <laughs> While the staff is doing this, after this, I'm going to take a couple of minute break, and then I want to do what I, this will conclude our business for today, but I want to do what I indicated before. I want to afford every jurisdiction here to uh, provide us with an initial indication of what their position is on item one and item two, okay? And so we'll take a little, a short break, just a couple of minutes after this, this motion gets dealt with, and then we're gonna go right around the table and that'll conclude the business for today. Yeah, I just wanted to, for the reconsidering, if the board would like to reconsider this vote tomorrow, someone from the prevailing side will have to bring for that motion for reconsideration. So I just wanted to let everyone know how that works. All right, uh, Mike and then Roy. First of all, if it's reconsidered tomorrow, wouldn't that require a two-thirds vote? I think we're saying it's the same meeting. Would you also consider at this point a motion to table this until tomorrow? You know, I mean, that's certainly appropriate. That's certainly within the purview of the, of the committee. It, it might generate a stronger discussion uh, tonight if we actually voted on it. Um, and then let the record be the record. If somebody comes up with a, a very convincing argument uh, overnight on why the position should change, or if in fact we do something tomorrow that dictates that, that the position should change, then we just follow the rules and reconsider. Mike? I was going to ask the same question about postponing till the morning, but um, if, that's, if you're not inclined to go down that path, we'll just go ahead and vote. All right, uh, so uh, you ready for the question here? All those in favor, oh, are we doing a roll call, excuse me. Um, so Megan, would you call a roll, please? Maine. No. New Hampshire. No. Massachusetts. Yes. Rhode Island. Yes. Connecticut. Yes. New York. Yes. New Jersey. 
Yes. Delaware. Yes. Maryland. Yes. Virginia. Yes. Noah Fisheries. No. And New England Councilor. Abstain. Right, so the, uh, do we have any null vote? Uh, so the, the motion, uh, the vote on it is eight to three uh, with one, one abstention and no, zero null vote. So motion passes. Okay, so the, the and I, I'd urge uh, members of the committee to continue the dialogue on this because uh, obviously there, there are different circumstances that would undoubtedly change the, the uh, motion on it. Okay, so the next, the, the next thing, and this is the final action today, uh, and as I announced earlier, uh, I would like um, to take a short caucus, a couple of minutes, have each jurisdiction basically, basically talk to the, your fellow uh, commissioners, uh, and then go around the room uh, and uh, not and basically ask uh, each jurisdiction to uh, tell all of us um, which uh, options you prefer on issue one, which is uh, the egg production uh, target. So the range of options there is basically status quo all the way up to 60% increase. And then I'd like, like I, when you have the floor to also comment on which of the management tool options uh, you prefer. Now, as I indicated before, the reason I'm doing this is I'm trying to uh, give individuals around the table some sense of how other jurisdictions are, are looking at, at this issue. Nothing is binding. There's no commitment. If you want to change your position uh, tomorrow, you can. But this, by doing this, what I'm trying to do is promote a dialogue of the, of the group here overnight uh, and tomorrow at breakfast or, or whenever. Uh, if, if the majority all fall on one particular point, I think this, this uh, strategy will make the going easier tomorrow. So what I would like to do is to uh, start north to south and have Megan call off each jurisdiction and basically have them uh, comment. So uh, let's take a two minute or three minute uh, caucus break uh, and then we'll go north to south. And then when we get into the actual vote, we'll go south to north tomorrow. Uh, I'll give you another two minutes because I can see there's a lot of discussion going on. Right, as I indicated before, and I just want to make sure the record is absolutely clear on this. This is not a vote. That's number one. Number two, it does not bind any jurisdiction to what they say here. It's just a preliminary indication of 
of uh, what you are thinking. If you want to change your position in the morning, you can change your position in the morning. This is non-binding. So if we have any members of the press in the room, do not publicize this because it is a non-binding activity. <clears throat> okay, so Megan, will you call the states and we'll go around? Uh, and I, uh, given the time, we are not gonna have any debate. It, whatever you say is, is your position, and then we'll adjourn when we're finished. Thank you. Maine. Status quo. New Hampshire. Pa oh. Pat, can I, just for clarification, do you have any position on the second item? Oh, I'm sorry. I was being inclusive. So status quo on option one, item two uh, would be take no management action. Okay. Thank you. New Hampshire. So, Mr. Chairman, based on the last vote we took, we're going to, we would support uh, status quo. We came here prepared to support reductions of 20 to 40 percent uh, using the gauge size, preferably. Uh, but given the fact that we're now going to, at least under the current um, vote, after the last vote, we'd be implementing um, uh, management measures that would uh, be impacting a fully rebuilt stock up in the Gulf of Maine and the fishery that takes place up there. Uh, we're going to, we would support zero uh, increase. Massachusetts. Status quo. Rhode Island. Status quo. Connecticut. Status quo. New York. Um, well, let me split this with this new approach here with uh, you show your hand and then you bet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, for, for area six, status quo because uh, of its, you know, uniqueness, whatever. For, and then for area four, we'll, we'll like to hear more discussion. Maybe a slight, slight reduction. New Jersey. Status quo. Delaware. Uh, given that de minimis, which is something that our states from Delaware, Maryland, Virginia were looking for, won't really be effective for federal waters, uh, we prefer status quo, but we'll consider uh, a reduction. Maryland? We'd support status quo, but would, we could consider um, a reduction up to option B, but not any further than option B, which is 20%. But we support status quo. Virginia? <laughs> In this case, last certainly is least. Uh, <laughs> um, Joe, I, Joe, was it a contentious uh, caucus? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I would like to go on record, and, and as other board members for the Mid-Atlantic region have, it would be great to have more information on what's happening in the Mid-Atlantic, and I hope going forward that someday we do see that. Um, but, you know, for right now, I think uh, status quo makes the most sense for us. Thank you. Noah? You spoke too soon, Joe. I guess last is least, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I'll say that uh, uh, the one thing we won't support is status quo. Uh, the, what the technical committee has shown us and what the, what, the, uh, what the stock assessment has shown is that even though uh, a lot of the stock decline is due to climatic factors and an inhospitable habitat, uh, we know that uh, fishing mortality is still the largest source of mortality for the stock. Uh, and we know it's in this document that uh, some management measures could be useful and could help if we do have, uh, if we do optimize our egg production and we get some, uh, we get some cooperation from Mother Nature. So uh, we don't want to go with status quo. Um, we certainly can't support any th types of trap productions that have already taken place. Uh, we know that uh, those trap productions don't, um, uh, aren't targeted solely on active traps and they don't permanently remove traps from the water. We know that uh, over the last two years our trap transfer program has allowed the fleet to 
buy back 30% of the traps that we've cut and activate them back into the fishery. So I think we're fooling ourselves if we think that we're getting all the reductions that we think we're getting for trap reductions. And because most of that is not from active and permanent effort being removed, we're not getting the egg production uh, uh, benefits that we, that we think we're getting. So I'll leave it at that for now. All right, uh, that concludes our business uh, for today. We'll, we'll resume the fun tomorrow. Uh, uh, Bob, do you have an announcement relative to an attitude adjustment, Alan? Yeah. <laughs> the best I can offer is room 633 in about 15 minutes. Thank you very much. See everybody in the morning.